Well, hello everyone. This is Byron King with Investor Intel coming to you from PDAC 2022 in sunny Toronto. Uh, this is an all-star panel on the rare earth uh, sector. We have some absolutely uh, spectacular uh, guests today. Uh, to my far right, Boyd Davis from Kingston Process Metallurgy. Uh, to my immediate right, John Hikeaway, a longtime name in the rare earth field from Stormcrow. To my left, Pat Ryan with UCOR, and to my far left, Jeff Atkins from Vital. Gentlemen, it is a pleasure to be with you. We, uh, you know, there is so much to talk about. Uh, let's just begin with, you know, we, people are very, some people are very into the rare earth space. Other people just sort of know, oh, we need those rare earths to make the cars run. Uh, let's have a real quick discussion about uh, these mandates that we see coming from government and these promises that we see coming from industry that by the year 2030, the year 2035, what have you, we're going to have just millions and millions of EVs riding the roads, we put the oil business, oil companies out of business, all that. Uh, you know, is there, uh, is, is, there, is there some sanity that you can bring to this discussion? John, why don't you, uh, why don't you kick off, give us a comment on that, please. You're asking me for sanity, Byron? Well, okay. If, well, we'll start somewhere. Try it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I would say, first point I'd like to make is you, you, had, you questioned whether there's any sanity to governments saying that we're all going to be driving a battery electric vehicle by 2030. The, the simple answer to that is no. No. Um, and it's and it's as simple as taking a look at the amount of oil products, gasoline, diesel that Canadians, for example, use every day, mm -hmm. and then doing the required conversion to see how much electrical energy you'd require to replace that driving that's being done in gasoline and diesel with mm -hmm. electricity, the answer is we don't have a grid that's anywhere close to being able to supply that. Oh, you bring up thermodynamics, you would spoil the party yeah, with something like that. Let me, let me ask Boyd. Boyd, you are in the processing business. Can, I mean, in, in the next 10 and 12 years, is there an industrial plan to process the amount of materials that the world thinks it's going to need to do some of this? Well, I think the, you'll, you'll end up with some domestic production in North America and Europe in the next 10, 12 years for sure. And uh, the, the amount that that gets put into will just depend on how much uh, we want to be you know, in with China and how much we want to be away from China. And that will be dictated by the cost and supply, security, and, and the ability to get raw materials so you have to combine all those things together and you'd imagine there's going to be a mix of some domestic production and some offshore. Mm -hmm. but let's turn, Jeff, you, you came up here all the way from Australia, which is a long walk, uh, and, and we're really grateful that you, that you would come up to Toronto for this. Uh, you, we have talked before, you have mentioned that we, we have to have the end users really buy into all of this. Can you explain to the viewers what, what does that mean? Who are the end users and, and how, do they, how do they drive the process here? I, I think fundamentally it comes down to what your supply chains are. Mm -hmm. And at the, for a number of years and a number of different products, companies have been happy with a single source of supply uh, through just-in-time uh, inventory management and things like that. What I think we're coming to is a situation where you've got the end users, so your electric vehicle manufacturers, those type of people, you know, computer manufacturers, who are actually starting to look at changing that and needing a diversified supply chain and assessing their risks on single point of failure and things like that. And it's not really about a um, you know, China issue or anything like that. It, to me, it's actually quite a bit simpler than that. It's purely, if you're reliant on products coming from one source, the risk of something going wrong is going to have a massive impact on your on your business. So the question then comes down to those end users, so those OEMs, those electric vehicle manufacturers, computer manufacturers, what value are they going to put on de-risking their supply chain? As in just in time becomes just not in time and exactly. you shut the whole plant down. And, well, exactly. And what you're seeing is a fundamental shift, particularly from an electric vehicle perspective where traditionally they've been dealing with commodities. And when you think about the inputs which go into a, into a traditional vehicle, it's all basically commodities. It, you're talking about metal, you're talking about you know, plastics and things like that. As soon as you move into EVs, you're starting to deal with high technology chemicals um, and those types of things which are a completely different product. They have a different procurement process, uh, a, a 
very different qualification process, and that basically re requires a fundamental shift to how procurement will actually work and how those supply chains will work. And that's where I think you'll see that shift in uh, for, for those end users in terms of how they procure. Thank you. Uh, now let's talk with Pat, Pat Ryan of UCOR. Pat, you have a background, a business background in the automobile industry where you, you, you supply items to the auto builders and by the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands. So you, what is your perspective on uh, supplying literally millions of distinct items that the automotive industry is going to need? What, what, what has to happen? Well, that's right. We do, uh, we supply millions of parts to the automotive industry currently, and that's the internal combustion engine. And as Jeff just noted, you know, you've got uh, six times more critical minerals in an EV than you do in a conventional internal combustion engine. So six times more, and I heard the stat that in 2020, 0.4 million tons of critical minerals were used um, in the electrification of vehicles. But the 2050 goal, which is your net zero decarbonization climate change, requires something like 18 million tons. That's a big jump. Um, so who's, uh, who's going to roll the dice and win? Uh, if you look at the investments currently there announced by automotive companies, they've got about um, north of uh, $500 billion invested. Billion with a B. Billion with a B. So more than half a trillion dollars currently uh, noted. In 2020, that number was about $225 billion. So in a matter of two years, that number's doubled what the intended investments are by, by the end of it. And it's quite simply this, if they, don't make that investment, they won't be able to build the EVs they want, they won't be able to build them at the cost they want, they won't have the materials that they want, and so, like a domino effect, Biden has announced uh, Build Back America, 50% of vehicles will be EV by 2030. Well, of the 250 million US vehicles right now, 1% are EV. So it's a big job to get there. So the auto companies are investing, they're all in. They, uh, uh, you know, in North America, General Motors, Ford, Tesla, they're in. VW in Europe, they're in. That's, well, that's, that's a good start point for sort of the next question. Boyd, I'm going to turn to you on this. Um, for decades now, there have, been a, there have been certain standard industrial processes, it's called solvent extraction, to, to create these, these products that you need. Uh, and SX, solvent extraction. So can the future that we see, that we're just talking about, can, can the conventional uh, metallurgy, the conventional hydrometallurgy, can it handle that level of new demand and can it scale up to what needs to be? You, you've, you've worked in this field, so what, what's your perspective on that? Uh, well, it depends on what process you're talking about. If you're talking in the rare earth space, mm -hmm. you know, we, have, we have two examples at our place where we have, we have the same chemistry that's going on in both. So mm -hmm. we're working on, uh, you know, with UCOR, we're work, working on a solvent extraction process. Uh -huh. Uh, and that has different components to it. And it allows one to bring standard technology into play, but westernize it so that the cost of production is reduced. And it is de-risk, but has novelty to it where you can make the cost lower. In metal production, we have cell designs that have again westernized metal production so that you don't have people um, in harm's way you don't have problems with cell life. You can operate them in a way that makes sense, but the chemistry, again, is, is the same chemistry. Mm -hmm. So you just have to bring the technology that exists into a world, in the Western world, where it can be applied and effective. Mm -hmm. you, you have people who, who are doing a, a, a job that's safe and responsible and can produce large amounts of material for a smaller capital and smaller operating costs. I see. John, I'm going to turn to you on this. You have, personally, you have extensive experience dealing with China and the Chinese upstream uh, rare earth business. Mm -hmm. They are an they are the established player in the world with yep. you know, you know, 85, 90 percent, depending on how you want to measure it, of the rare earth. What, what's your, what, what can you tell us about? What do the Chinese think about their future, and what do they see when they look out and they see all these, you know, smaller. You know, companies out there in the world saying, "Yeah, we're going to we're going to take on those Chinese and whatever." What, what what's their perspective on that? What well, do they say? First, boy, they're 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 really not paying much attention to what's going on in were, the West. Were that unless, insignificant? <laughs> unless unless you're a significantly sized producer, uh -huh. um, a la uh, an MP Materials or something right. like that, or a Linus. Linus or something. Um, 
I've been over there and been asked to speak at conferences and effectively bring them intelligence about the juniors in the space because they simply don't have the time to pay attention. Now, as that having been said, they're actually, to a degree, curtailing their industry. They've, they've reined it in a little bit. Mm -hmm. They want to ensure that they have enough to supply the Chinese new energy vehicle makers. Mm -hmm. The rest of the world would be nice, but the state-owned enterprises in China are not going to concern themselves with supplying enough for everybody in the world unless it benefits state-owned enterprises in China through job creation or the like. Mm -hmm. The technology side, Boyd made a very good point, you have to safety proof some of the technology that's deployed in China because let's face it they were not that concerned about it mm -hmm. in terms of in terms of ensuring their, the safety of their workforce and the environment when they started this industry but I'd add another critical element for the West which is not only do you have to make it safe enough for Western workers and, and the like you also have to make sure that there's going to be enough of a return um, on the production of this uh, materials and, and through these new pieces of equipment mm -hmm. for Western for Western firms, there has been a period of time, a significant period of time between about 2010 and the present day, when it was very difficult for anybody to make a living making rare earths. So when you look at a new technology like the Rapid SX that's being developed by Boyd mm -hmm. uh, at, at KPM and and obviously belongs to indirectly directly to Ucor. Mm -hmm. um, the cost saving, the capital cost saving, as well as the operational cost saving that comes with deploying a technology like that, coupled to the fact that it's related almost directly to the old solvent extraction. Mm -hmm. So it's failure modes and drifts away from specification are understood. All of that will play very, very well in the West. It's just a more cost effective way to produce the same thing. Mm -hmm. Very good, that, that actually gives me an opportunity to turn to Pat. Uh, Pat, you. Uh, you are you are a builder. You you build plants. You put in, you put machines in them, and you crank out product. So, what do you see as the future for Ucor or the industry in general uh, in the West to, to to meet the new supply that's or the new demand? I'm sorry, that's coming down the line here. Well, as Boyd said, you've got to westernize uh, what's happening in China right now. You've got to you've got to plug it into the Western world. You've got to have an ESG overlay. And uh, as John just said, you know, you've got to have a lean manufacturing mentality. Uh, you've got to have work scale and, and uh, ramp up ability, which is what Vital's doing. And uh, you've got to scale accordingly. But uh, it's all about uh, little touch time, automation, put the right amount of capital in and scale up from there effectively. Get your operational costs under control and, and you'll do well. Um, now, if you go head to head with the economic conditions that are in China, you might run into a problem. So I think any uh, processing you're doing in North America, you've got to take it a step beyond. You've got to get a little bit better. You've got to hedge your bets and make sure you're, you're ultra competitive uh, with China, but you're actually taking a step forward and getting better than what China is. That, that's, that's crucial to going forward. Uh, the success that I've had in the automotive industry has been innovating. You've got to innovate your process. You've got to use lean manufacturing, uh, Kaizen, continuous improvement, all the things that are just all in to make sure you're, you're really, really on top of uh, your game because um, you will get hunted down and people will look to take your market share. Scale up, use work cells, and you'll be in good shape. See. Jeff, you, you uh, are from Australia, we mentioned, and you, you work with Vital Metals in North America. You also, in your company, you also have relationships with the European Union. Yes. And in terms of what is the EU doing versus what we see in North America, in the US and Canada, what's the relative uh, you know, balance there? Are they ahead? Far ahead, a little bit ahead, about the same. What would you say? Look, the European market typically has more of a history in the uh, in the rare earth supply chain. So mm -hmm. they do have existing manufacturing facilities able to do metals, alloying, magnets, motors, things like that. So, but it still needs to be scaled up. And the question really comes down to the ability to scale that up, making a commercial return. Um, at the end of the day, as Pat said, to you're starting a new supply chain. And there's a number of steps in that, which means that companies and you know, countries have to, you, know, you have to walk before you can run. So it's all about proving your capabilities. Once you do that, you then have that opportunity to ramp up. And look, at the moment, I think the European market is certainly further ahead than what the, uh, the US market is. Um, but you know, the approach from, from each different, uh, different area is, is different. Um, so yeah, it's a. Everyone has to ramp it up. 
everyone has to expand and everyone has to diversify their supply chain. So you know, there's not really that much difference between it, I don't think. Well, in terms of ramping things up, you know, we, we talk about the rarest supply chain, but there are many other supply chains that feed that supply chain. I mean, for the chemicals, for the machinery, certainly for the, for, for the people, just the, the mental and the intellectual skills. Uh, but Boyd, can you comment on that? What do you see going on in that, in sort of the branches of the supply chain and the branches of that tree or the roots of that tree? Are they out there ready to roll or oh, what? Oh yeah, I think the chemicals are all there. Uh, these are commodity things. Mm -hmm. uh, the people need to be trained. Uh, when we when we developed uh, when we helped Lifecycle, which is a battery recycling company, commercialize, we had 50 people in the pilot plant, and uh, at the end of that, we just, they just took them on and started commercialized op operation in Kingston. Mm -hmm. was, I think they were operational within a couple of months of finishing the pilot. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you know, you can use those opportunities to train people up to. Uh, you can you can keep a stage going where where they can use that as a training mm -hmm. vehicle as well. Life Cycle's building a training center for their people to to develop that. So the skills, I think we have some smart people in the country. I think this should be okay. I, I don't see a, a big block there. I, I in the commercialization, I see the issues are more about doing the right things at the right time, knowing what you need to do to commercialize and what you don't need to do doing it at the right scale, mm -hmm. understanding where the cost drivers are. Mm -hmm. These are important things. And a lot of people can just end up in too uncertain of a path and it takes a long time and they don't get to where they want to get to. The other thing which people have to recognize when you're looking at setting up these industries are they are complex. And the importance of setting up at the right scale and doing that properly, because you also have to recognize that things will go wrong. So you have to understand where the risks lie and try to minimise those risks because you know, things will go wrong when you're commercialising it, when you're ramping it up. So what you need to do is you need to make sure that when that does eventually does happen, it's not actually going to be a company killer. And that's where I think there's a lot of lessons to be learnt in terms of how you actually commercialise that. Um, and that's one of the things, you know, walk before you can run because you know, by starting at the right scale, you're able to learn, you're able to make changes as you do commission your plants or ramp, or ramp them up. And doing that at the right, in the right way will help ensure that you're successful in the long run. Mm -hmm. Well, since I'm, since I'm leaning this way, I'll ask, I'll ask Pat. As, as someone who has built large, significant industrial plants and you know, put big lines of machinery in, are these plants of the future, are they going to be uh, you know, manpower intensive, people power intensive? Are they going to be dark factories where they're just, you know, there's, there's, there's a guy and a dog and the dog's job is to bite the guy if he tries to do anything, the guy's dog, job is to feed the dog? I mean, what are we looking at in terms of, of, uh, of, of the few, these future plants? I think the, uh, the more automation is always better. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at what's, what's happening in America right now with, and I'm sure in Australia and elsewhere with your labor rates, Labor rates are really escalating. For the first time ever, the uh, consumer price index is less than the labor rate. The labor rate has just skyrocketed recently. And I think in America currently there's a 3.6% unemployment rate. Um, you know, with that, the, the, the labor wages are way up and we still have a very huge inflation. So manufacturing of the future, you've got to look at it and again, back to lean manufacturing, which means eliminate waste. You've got to have little touch time. In order to have little touch time, you've got to automate. In order to automate, you've got to have technicians as opposed to just laborers sitting there feeding the dog or you know, whatever they might be doing. But uh, yeah, you've got to certainly automate. And, and to build on what Jeff and uh, Boyd were saying, in the automotive industry, there's a technique known as FMEA. It stands for Failure Mode Effect Analysis. Yes. And it's de-risking. And the de-risking is you think of every possible failure that could come up. Then you consider what can be done if that failure happens to resolve it. And then you test for it to make sure it doesn't happen. And the testing part of it is called the DVPNR. I won't get too technical, but it's Design Verification Plan and Reporting. So you're identifying everything that could, could go wrong. You get all the plans in place to make sure it doesn't happen. If it happens, you know what to do. And, uh, but full circle back to your question, you've got to automate. Labor rates are going up, you've got to automate. If you're going to be economically hedged against the Chinese who are looking to take all that home for themselves and build all the EVs of the future, automate, be smart with your processing, and you'll be super competitive and make it happen. Uh, let's turn to, uh, turn to, turn to John. Are there, uh, 
Let's get, let's get back to where the, where the, how do the Chinese view all of this? So they have an established industry, they yep. have ways of doing things, they've got massive, you know, past investments, you know, but, uh, and they have an entire uh, intellectual process for training people. They have universities that do oh, nothing yeah. but turn out chemical engineers Absolutely. who feed into this industry. What, uh, what, what's the Chinese view of this, or how do the Chinese make, make, make it work uh, in a way that, uh, that we have to be better? Well, for one, they're starting to draw on foreign sources of supply ah. within all of these critical materials. They've done it for years in lithium. They've, there are no really amazing lithium deposits in China. So mm -hmm. they've been pulling material in from South America, from Australia, mm -hmm. you name it. Um, they're constructing additional mines elsewhere, but they're also drawing on tailings. So in the rare earth space, for example, there are some significant programs in China that bring, for example, waste monazite from the heavy mineral sands mm -hmm. operations around the world, whether mm -hmm. in Africa or mm -hmm. Australia, and they bring them to China for right. post-processing to create rare earths and some other things as well. Um, they're fully cognizant of the fact that they have a demographic problem, and so they're going to look to automation as a solution for a shrinking workforce and also as a way to create a higher paid workforce mm -hmm. with time. The idea that the Chinese will continue to try to run their plants with thousands of poorly trained people in a world where we've already solved the automation issue is silly. I mean, we're, they're, they're going to do exactly the same sort of things that we've done. So they're adapting to, to the new world, but again, they've got a really significant problem in electrifying their own vehicle fleet, whether mm -hmm. it, as they term them, new energy vehicles, whether those are battery electric vehicles, plug-in hybrids, or just hybrids alone. Mm -hmm. um, and they've got some fairly unique solutions um, in that space mm -hmm. that fit the Chinese and perhaps the, the emerging markets better than some of the things that we're doing in the West. So it's, 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 a, little bit, it's a little bit of horses for courses. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, they're approaching it a little different. Yeah, well, it gets back to the point that you made earlier that you know, with an internal combustion engine, you burn the energy in the unit yep. and your CO2 goes out the tailpipe, right. whereas on an electric vehicle you're burning coal in a power plant and the CO2 goes up the stack, you right. know. So it's a, you've shifted the, uh, the energy load. Um, Boyd, Boyd let, me ask, let me ask you a question here. In terms of, you know, you work in Canada, you work in North America, uh, is the regulatory environment that we live in, our regulatory ecosphere, is it ready to accept uh, the things that are going to have to happen to build a uh, to build a to build a, a, a you know the, the rare earth the whole supply chain that we've been talking about are, are, they, are we ready to really see that development or are there just going to be roadblocks along the way that intentional or unintentional? I don't see much in the downstream side. These are chemical plants. Mm -hmm. uh, people build chemical plants all the time. There are permits and things you have to get, uh, mm -hmm. but it's the, on the mine side. I would say this is where it's it's a tougher go mm -hmm. in, in the permits and, and uh, but you know we, we're permitted we have permits for our, our work and mm -hmm. we've never had difficulties in, in scale up and, and uh, building chemical plants life cycle had no problem starting up their plant mm -hmm. uh, so I, I would say I'd say in, in, you know in, in Canada we know chemistry fairly well uh, we're, you know we, we, we kind of don't realize this but we're a pretty good chemists, mm -hmm. and uh, and there's a there's a chemical mindset that's uh, across the country, and so I don't see that that side is gonna is gonna stall us. I see that supply internal supply the mine side is gonna that's mm -hmm. what we need. Okay, well then then on that note, I'm going to bounce back over to our to our miner uh, with Vital Metals, uh, Jeff. Uh, same question, although we're, we'll spin the spin the angle towards. Uh, you know, mining permits. I mean, we're at the mining conference in Toronto. There, yesterday, there were about 50 people outside protesting mining, but then there were about 20,000 people who walked in. So do the math. But but tell us tell us your experience or tell us your perspective on the mining side permits. You know, will will North America permit? You know, permit both legally and just in a general sense these these kind of developments to, to occur that need to happen. Oh look, I can't really comment on will they or won't they yeah. or yeah. predict the future, but. But I think the reality is that in terms of developing a supply chain for downstream processing, it's almost a bit of a one, call it a one-off challenge. It's about getting an operation up and running and established. Once that's 
established, the expansion of that becomes far simpler. The challenge for mining is that, firstly, from a, a, a permitting perspective, it does take a lot longer. There is a lot more that you need to deal with. And this isn't just a North American thing. One of the, you know, asked before about a difference between the European market and the US market. The European market at the moment is um, very focused on life cycle costings, uh, responsible mining initiatives, track of traceability, things like that. And those types of questions will be asked far more. And that's not whether or not, and that's not just if you're mining in um, North America or Africa, it, you know, Africa is the same. There's a far greater shift towards responsible mining. Mm -hmm. And the bottom line is that the, you know, the old days of, of mining are gone. So now it's more around, okay, mining will have an impact. You have to accept mining will have an impact. So you have to do it as responsibly as possible with as little impact as possible. And you have to treat the local communities with the, the greatest level of respect and ensure that there's a net positive um, outcome for local communities. If you start to, you know, I would hope that if you start to make that transition, and make those changes, then you can start to actually get more support in those communities, which actually makes the permitting process easier as well. Okay. But at the end of the day, it's a long process. And one of the challenges for mining companies is that every time you look at expanding, you have to basically go through that same process all over again. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a manufacturing plant where once you have the approvals, expansion is a lot easier. Mining will always be more challenging. And that is why you know, once the supply chains are up and running, the natural bottleneck is going to be the, the raw material. ESG becomes a, a bigger and more important metric in mining investment. Mm -hmm. We're likely to not see a, a shortening of the chain of development of mines, a, 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 lo a lowering of the time that's required to bring a new mine into production. Frankly, we're probably going to see it remain the same or even lengthen out even further. And that creates a significant problem within the industries of critical materials because we're talking about materials that are produced in small quantity, they have relatively small markets, mm -hmm. but there are dynamics that are changing very rapidly in the background. I mean, as we look at the United States talking about making a significant fraction of all vehicles, either hybrids, plug-in hybrids, or battery electric vehicles right. by 2030, we have massively increased consumption numbers for a lot of these critical materials. If you're in a 10-year cycle to develop and you're fighting against other people who are in a 10-year mining cycle to develop a new mine, mm -hmm. but you've got dynamics that are changing dramatically in one or two years, you can see booms and busts in pricing that are going to result in some of these projects being thrown off the rails along the way. That's not good for any of these plans that are, that are trying to address climate change, trying to change the, the energy makeup of transportation or other things. I would love to see the government in Canada, hey, I'd love to see the government of the United States do it, but they can't agree on anything. I would love to see the government in Canada be in a position to start some kind of, of a critical material stockpile or a, or a critical materials buffer. Mm -hmm. That I was asked a question on a panel a while back that said, what would you change in the mining industry to make the whole thing easier? And there were some other, you know, people who on, in, in the, in the, on the panel who had gone through the wars in mining. And we raised a few ideas about regulation and environmental permissions and that sort of thing. But the thing that came to me afterwards was, wouldn't it be great if there was a government organization or at least a government supported organization that said, we believe rare earths are going to be essential to our new vehicle production in 2030 we're going to put standing purchase orders in mm -hmm. place mm -hmm. for these materials between price ranges mm -hmm. and we're going to buy everything that's being produced. In fact, we would come to UCOR and give UCOR an off day. Mm -hmm. That means UCOR can go out and raise debt financing more easily, it can go out and get everything mm -hmm. it needs to put in place. Mm -hmm. Jeff could go out and, you know, and do the same thing for Vital. And we'd have a buffer if demand rose too quickly this same organization, not looking to make a profit, mm -hmm. but could sell that material back into the marketplace right. to try and stabilize the market, which 
I think Pat would agree, above all things, the automotive market would like stabilized pricing on a lot of these commodities rather than rather than seeing them do this over time. I mean, one angle on that in the United States is, uh, you know, is there one central organization? Yeah, it's called the Department of Defense. Right. And there's another agency, the Defense Logistics Agency. And, you know, the idea is perhaps DLA would, they would buy quantities of this and, you know, lock it up in warehouses out in Utah or Nevada or something. And, you know, when there was spikes or troughs or whatever, they would, you know, somehow balance it. But that gets into sort of an industrial management yeah, thing that, I, that the American political psyche is not They're is, not. But is in not Canada, for. perhaps we could. Yeah. And, and in Canada, perhaps, given the size of these markets, we could actually make a difference yeah. in that regard. Well, that brings me to Pat uh, and the automotive industry where you know, we are, 2022, we are 100 years into sort of the mass production of automobiles. Uh, you know, sure, they were invented in the 1880s or 1890s, but, but by the 1920s, they started to become a thing. And in the olden days, you know, long before you or me, uh, Henry Ford, for example, believed in vertical integration to the point where he had iron mines in Minnesota and he had coal mines and rubber plants in plantations in Brazil, and he built the Rouge River uh, steel facility and do do you see perhaps on something like rare earths do you see the automotive industry perhaps you know buying their way upstream all the way to the face of the mine yeah absolutely uh, you know um, Henry Ford yeah he was all about vertical integration Jim Farley announced recently we're going back to the days of uh, Henry Ford he said we've got to vertically integrate we've got to have a sustainable diversified supply chain we have to keep ESG in our sites as we do that. Um, you know, look at investments that are being made by automotive companies today. You have BMW who invested in lithium and cobalt. Uh, General Motors is investing in rare earth. Um, you've got uh, uh, VW who's invested in lithium. I mean, they're, they're, they're going all the way back to the mine they have to in order to secure their way forward. So, yeah, that vertical inter integration is very important. Um, you know, it's different than the internal combustion engine because they learned 20, 30, 40 years ago, let's just cut it off here, call it a tier one, and let the people in the supply chain downstream deal with it. But now they've got to change all that thinking. Just like Henry Ford carried the rubber plants in Brazil and the steel factories on their books, they've got to carry mining, quite possibly mining, on their books now. They've got to make that happen in order to, again, supply the demand going forward, supply it at the price they want going forward, so. And that goes against everything that people have learned in business schools for the last 40 and 50 years, too. Right. But, if it's but, not but a Byron, profit center, you have to you know, sell it off right. or something. But Byron, there was, there was a long period in the automotive industry where you were working with nothing but readily available commodities, right? right? You mm -hmm. needed steel, maybe once in a while you needed a specialty steel, but there were multiple suppliers that could give you that. Mm -hmm. You needed aluminum, you needed you know, certain things that were readily available. Copper, zinc, what have now, you. Now yeah. you're talking about for lack of a few kilos of rare earth and, a, and, a, and an electric motor, you're not going to be able to push cars out of a plant. So all of a sudden, in that very tight, very small market, you've got to be able to access the critical materials that you need or shut down a plant. Yeah. It's a different world. Yeah, well, they're called critical materials because I guess they're critical. Yeah, I, I, we're, I we're actually, you know, if I, I'm sorry, though, go so ahead, Jeff. Yeah. Rare, rare earth is a little bit different <coughs> to lithium and cobalt, though, because for something like lithium, where you get to take a spodumene product, you go into lithium hydroxide, which goes into the battery. It's a couple of steps, and it's a fairly well understood process. The challenge you have with rare earths is to go, before it goes into a car, you've got to have your drive unit. From there, you need your magnet. To get your magnet, you need your license to produce a magnet. To go into the magnet, you need to have an alloying plant, and then you need a metal plant, and then you need your separation plant, then you need your extraction plant then you need, before you get to the mine. So from a, you know, a car manufacturer saying, okay, we need to go and lock up the basic, like the raw material, okay, that's fine, but there's a huge gap between it. It'd be like saying, we need high, you know, uh, specialized plastic, so we're gonna go and, uh, and invest in an oil, oil rig, Funda fundamentally. So that's where the challenge comes in. And I think the fact that rare earths are such a small market, exactly as what John said, it makes rare earths that little bit more difficult for the car manufacturer. So I can see certainly going more into the lithium cobalt space first, see what they can learn from that perspective. But personally, I would see it being a number of years, I might be wrong, but I'd see it a number of years before anybody um, really 
bites the bullet to go into rare earths because that would be a hell of a conversation to have with your risk committee. Well, and on that note, I regret to say that we have come to the end of our time. And much as we would love to continue this and we could continue this, uh, we, are, we are at the mercy of the clock. And uh, for, I certainly thank our distinguished panel. This has just been a fabulous and fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for, for your time and for your Thanks. openness. Uh, audience out there, thank you for watching. Uh, Byron King with Investor Intel. Uh, and as the saying goes, make them beg for more. Sorry, but that's all, folks. <laughs>